in terms of what we're covering, I'm basically going to breeze through a bunch of basics of greenwash with all the environmental claims out there. You know, what do you actually pay attention to? Who's keeping an eye on things? I'm going to spend more time than taking a high-level view look at certif the certifications world and uh, criteria used to evaluate what certifications are really doing their job. But most of the webinar, we're going to be digging into the certifications themselves, what's most relevant for specifications, obviously, both by issues of concern, emissions for forestry, that kind of thing, and then also certifications available by specific product sectors. And I'm planning on saving some good time for Q&A, and also hope we can continue discussions online via email, whatever works. Yeah, we'll give you a heads up when there's um, 10 minutes to go. Oh, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. Um, learning objectives basically help you understand basic quality characteristics of certifications, strengths and weaknesses of specific labels, and then also explore how do we use these tools in context, despite their limitations. All right, into the nine types of greenwash. And in my, in my grand scheme of things, each of these would be laid out separately with, you know, beautiful pictures making it all very funny, but I didn't get that far. So, outright lying, number one, we still see this. Either intentionally or inadvertently, a company bends the truth or simply ignores it. So a product displays an environmental certification that it hasn't actually earned. Uh, or a glass manufacturer claims recycled content based on reuse of scrap when a manufacturing, within a manufacturing line which doesn't meet the definition of recycled. You still see this out there. Green by association, a company slathers itself and its marketing thoroughly in environmental terms and images. So that even if the product doesn't have environmental benefits, Consumers associate it that way. Lack of definition. Marketing for a product makes an environmental claim that sounds good, but it's too vague or general. Then we have unproven claims. Environmental claims are made by the company, but the company cannot or will not provide evidence to back them up. So, for instance, a company says they've improved their manufacturing process to increase a product's recycled content, but doesn't certify it or doesn't give you any verification of that. The non sequitur is when a company uses a valid claim about the product as a basis to further claim other things that isn't really warranted. So, for instance, we've seen you know, manufacturing claims that a product is resistant to mold growth and then goes on to say, which means it's great for indoor air quality without saying anything about VOCs or other things. So that kind of claim, there are you know, a number of organizations that deal with that. The business, Better Business Bureau, the FTC's Green Guides, and then even a common sense sniff test, you know, you can kind of tell, <laughs> you can kind of tell when there's a claim that, that isn't attached to, to a robust certification. What we're going to be spending most of our time with, though, are the next types of greenwash, which are really the, the more subtle, uh, the more subtle versions of greenwash. And here is where you have to start to understand, well, what is a certification about? So, for instance, forgetting the life cycle. So a company chooses one easily understood aspect of a product's environmental profile, such as, environment, such as recycled content, but they ignore the other significant impacts. So another thing is rallying behind a low standard. That's where a product earns an apparently valid third-party certification, but the product's manufacturer or trade association has influenced the development of that standard in a way that makes the certification less meaningful than it first appears. We've all seen that. Reluctant enthusiasts. So that's when a company avoids and fights a higher standard, proclaiming that meeting it will be really, really hard and costly, uh, spending a whole bunch of money to sort of try to keep that standard low. And then when a higher standard comes into existence, it meets the standard, proclaims its greenness, uh, continues to fight other efforts to make it higher. Then you have the bait and switch. So this is a company that heavily promotes the environmental attributes of a single product while selling and manufacturing a lot of otherwise similar products that lack the same environmental attribute. So like we'll see Home this. Depot? Sorry? Like Home Depot? Is Home Depot one of those? Can I, I'm not going to name any names. Okay. <laughs> you, you could make, I mean, so an example that I would give is you, you get a, you know, a, a company that's selling FSC, that says it sells FSC certified product. Mm -hmm. and, and it's splashing that all over the place, but when it right, com, comes right down to it, that's you know, a special or a brick order product that's back ordered most of the time that you can't really get at an increased price, you know, very little volume. Mm -hmm. So they've got a lot of attention for that, but when it comes right down to it, you're not going to be able to specify and get the product from them. 
So what do you do about these? Well, forgetting the life cycle, that's one where if you're starting to go from single attribute claims to a multi-attribute standard, you can start to address that kind of concern. The other ones, rallying behind a lower standard and the reluctant enthusiast, that's really, you have to start looking at the standard itself. This is kind of a preview of what we're going into later. Um, but basically, what I'm trying to say here is, you know, there's some types of greenwash that are rather obvious once you start to, to get into this, and you can learn to just ignore them. And we have tools, the FTC is really funny, trying to crack down more and more on these, and the certifications really help with those. Then you have some more subtle things, uh, which is where we, we need to have a better understanding of the standards development process, certifications, and you know, how those tools really work uh, in order to see, well, well, what's going on here? So um, bait and switch, uh, there's actually increasing, an increasing number of standards that are starting to, start, are starting to look at the corporate level. Uh, at, at what's a company's entire uh, set of products and what's a company's performance even beyond that. So again, this was just a sort of a little quick preview of what we're going to start to get into. And Jennifer, yep. we just have a question from the group here. Would you be able to give an example, um, without naming names at all, um, about the idea behind rallying behind a low standard, um, you know, kind of an idea of, you know, just a very generic idea of what that is. A couple of people are wondering if you could just break that down a little bit more for us. Or if that's in a future slide, we can always come to it then. <laughs> Would SFI be an example of that, Jennifer? Again, Good by word. Uh, again, I, I'm not sure I want to name specific okay. names in terms mm -hmm. of that one. Um, but depending on how high you think the standard should be, that could move in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I'm laughing because I know now that when I, this is, this, is a, this is the first time that I've displayed this outside of the certifications report, which some of you may have, have looked at, um, and I'm laughing because uh, I know in the future that I'm going to need to make sure I know which names I'm willing to state and which ones I'm not. <laughs> So, all right, I think this is probably going to be pretty basic for the audience. So in terms of how the certification world works, simplest, manufacturer makes a product, certifying body reviews the product, designers specify the product on that basis. We all know it's not actually that simple. Certification is actually generally based on a standard. And it's the standard and the standard development process that tell you a lot about the rigor of the certification. On the other hand, what you typically see on the product is the green label. And these may or may not be associated with a rigorous certification or standard. A lot of greenwash works because of label confusion. Beyond that, sometimes manufacturers will bypass the certification process entirely by claiming to meet the requirements of the standard, so with verification from a testing lab. And sometimes this really is all you need, but not necessarily. So the certification body may be more rigorous in ensuring the sample provided is truly representative and in requiring recertification at appropriate intervals. So be selective in terms of whether you accept test re results in lieu of certification. So the most robust standards are generally considered those developed through the formal voluntary consensus process, as defined by the International Standards Organization, the ISO, and in North America by ANSI. So ANSI standards are the most recognized and used by governments and industry. And um, it gets a little tricky, though. So for one thing, there are a number of ANSI-accredited standard development organizations, but they may or may not be using the full ANSI process and developing ANSI-approved standards. So that's something to pay attention to is to make sure that uh, when you're looking at these standards, that it is in, indeed an ANSI-approved standard and not just an accredited SDO that hasn't gone through the full process. So there's another kind of debate here um, that happens in the industry around, it's kind of, I see it as kind of the elephant in the room, uh, around you have these consensus processes and uh, the question is, are they really producing high bar rigorous standards? And on the one hand, um, some people will say yes, some people will say no, and that's where you start getting these proprietary standards where 
you know, FSC or um, cradle to cradle or SMART, where they're not actually following the ANSI process, and part of their argument is that they can create a higher standard based on that. Um, maybe I can get a little feedback just quickly. Is is this kind of thing something that's basic level of understanding for folks, or it's helpful to go through it? Uh, no, I think it's important that people just understand there are three types of labels under the ISO standard. Um, okay, good. So I'll just I'll just go through anything, everything that I that I've got here. Uh, so. As was just stated, there are different ISO rules to define the types of labels that you'll see. So type 1 labels are basically the check mark saying, you know, we've vouched that this product is good. Uh, type 2 labels are verifiable green claims. So pretty much anything that you'd see on, you know, on a manufacturer's uh, website about, you know, my product is recycled, content, bio-based, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Type 3 labels are comprehensive environmental product disclosures, which are, uh, let's see. And then so there's another sort of whole other angle to it, which is whether it's first party certified, which is basically the manufacturer self-declares the claim, second party certified, which is an interested party, which is really isn't truly independent, but it is a step removed or you have third-party certification by an independent party with no financial interest. And the way ISO defines it, type 2 labels really are, are defined as first-party declarations. Uh, but you can have those claims, like recycled content, second-party or third-party certified. Type 1 labels really are meant to be third-party certified. And the uh, same goes for type 3 labels. Uh, but you'll find that in, in the real world, of, of certifications. Not everybody's following those ISO rules cleanly, and so you'll see things that look like type 1 labels that are actually first party declarations and so forth. And that's where you start getting into greenwash to pay attention to. So this is just a step back. Uh, this is a poll of designers that a design firm shared with us, uh, not in vision design actually, but we like the picture. And we were excited to see that sustainability criteria actually did make the top of the list. But one of the things that we were noting is that there's a key priority that wasn't on this, which was just getting the job done. And so I want to acknowledge that you know the sustainability criteria is really just one of many priorities. And what we're trying to do with this presentation is really get to the given limited information available. How do we, you know, how do we do the best we can? All right. And I just have to stop for a second. I'm, I'm going to sort of breeze through some of this because I have to tell you that I'm usually the one behind the scenes. <laughs> so, um, you know, so we'll do this presentation, get to the Q&A, and then we'll get into the really good stuff. All right, so we'll be focusing here mostly on the established standards and certifications. This is the, the left-hand column. There's also really interesting work going on at the categories on the right. And I'll touch briefly on a few of them, but these are all areas to watch, even when there's not much to base specifications on today. And you're also going to see tables like the one below, this is my key, of standards and certifications with this assessment key. Uh, so it's, it's kind of dense, but we'll make sure the presentation is available afterwards if there's standards that you want to revisit. So uh, on the left-hand side of the key, the ones in gray, those are standards, and on the right hand, there are certifications. Are these found on your slideshow? Yep. Okay. We'll be seeing those a bunch as we go mm -hmm. through. A thing to watch out for in particular are, are ones where there's that, that little bar inside it where it says detriment or weak point, those are something that there's something in particular that to keep mm -hmm. an eye on. So and just to be clear, there's not very many that, that I put the greatest benefit that full circle on. You'll see going down you know there's there's pros and cons to pretty much every certification out there. All right. So Energy Star it's it's the it's the best known certification relevant to this industry. It covers over fifty product categories. 
Uh, and as many of you know, Energy Star certification and enforcement has gotten much more rigorous recently after embarrassment by the U.S. Government Accountability Office, which basically the Government Accountability Office came in, tried and succeeded in getting bogus products approved through the system, uh, which created a whole bunch of hoopla. It, pro it provided a high-profile example of the drawbacks to self-certification, which through Energy Star is no longer an option. So now there's staff review and third-party lab results required and, for the system. And Jennifer, I believe it was announced today that they're not pursuing their data collection. Uh, they've lost their funding for it. They had oh. a five-year program they were planning on, and that's, um, I guess, gone now. Oh, dear. Thanks for that. Funding revoked. Do you know if that, uh, well, I guess we're next getting to, to WaterSense, which is similar to that. I'm curious how that, how that might affect WaterSense. So, but anyway, so beyond Energy Star, for those seeking to specify more products that are more efficient than, say, the top 25%, which is what Energy Star claims to cover, there's the Consortium for Energy Efficiency has standards where Energy Star is really the, the, the base tier, and it has tiers above that. It's a really good program, along with, of course, government guidelines, Title 24, others in California, and model codes, uh, which start to go beyond Energy Star. Those are very worth looking at. There's also, uh, there's also a number of programs that are, that are coming into play. EP uh, Green Seal has a standard, and then UL is also starting to come up with standards that are looking at energy-consuming products where energy is, is is really the top concern from a life cycle basis, but there are other issues, uh, including uh, toxicity in, in the materials, uh, that are worth looking at. And so they're starting to, to try to broaden the, the view beyond just uh, energy consumption. So I also put EnerGuide and EnergyGuide up here, which are those standard, efficiently, standard appliance efficiency labels that you see. Put them on the list just because they provide what's hard to get in other areas of concern, which is just clear, consistent disclosure of performance. If we could find something like that and that could become the status quo everywhere, that would be great. Moving on to WaterSense. WaterSense is it. Use it. Um, it has tighter oversight and performance than Energy Star. It was, it was designed that way from the start. It's really quite a good program, and they're expanding the number of categories that they're dealing with uh, continually. So there's other things, model codes like the IAPMO 2010 Green Plumbing and Mechanical Code Supplement, you know, ASHRAE 189. There's other things that provide guidance on water-efficient plumbing systems, but for fixtures, WaterSense is really, uh, really where you're at. All right, going into indoor air emissions. Uh, the evolution of emissions certifications is really quite a story, and I'm going to cut to the chase is basically that there's two main philosophies now for testing the VOC emissions from a product. And there's a slew of labels that have been hung on those, too. So the first set was initiated by the carpet industry in the 1990s in response to carpet being implicated in a big profile, EPA, actually, a big profile case of sick building syndrome. So this approach is characterized by Green Guard indoor air quality certification and is concerned largely with acute reactions to short-term exposure. It's been the basis of LEED IAQ credit for over a decade. It started out that was the only thing that was out there. So the second set is based on California Section 1350 protocol. And it moved emissions testing from a focus on short-term TVOCs uh, to testing focused on ensuring emissions of specific VOCs with known health concerns do not exceed dangerous levels within a space, and looking at more chronic exposure concerns. A lot of the logos shown on this slide represent efforts by specific industries and certifiers to develop a program or label that lets them play in these spaces, so each with its own niche and story. So there's a story around BISMA basically saying, OK, well, we want an alternate to Green Guard so that we can get into LEED as well. Uh, so they created a standard around that. You know, each of these has a story for somebody wanting to play in the space. Uh, but so to cut through the label proliferation that we saw on the last slide, some specifiers are just requiring that products meet the California Section 1350 standard. And, and that's, you know, that's definitely a reasonable approach. A key point to remember, though, is that certification to the standard can provide 
like the certification can provide added rigor to ensure that the sample is representative, testing is up to date. So focusing on the standards behind them makes sense, discounts the value of the certification itself. So what's listed on this table are just the widely applicable IAQ certifications, uh, indoor air quality uh, emission certifications. You'll see others. Jennifer, yeah? do you know if um, LEAD for healthcare relies on Green Guard children in schools or whether they have a, their own? Uh, I don't know that offhand. Okay. Making a note to myself. I actually had an old list that I was trying to develop for certifications and leads and haven't completed it. So sorry not to have that. Um, so yeah. Let's see, one of the things about 1350 I want to mention is that there's now a program with a residential setting. So the way 1350 is designed, um, they have a protocol for offices and for different spaces uh, in terms of what are the emissions, what are the emissions contribute, contributions to those spaces um, from a particular product. That, that's considered allowable. And so there's a new residential proto protocol that's, that's more stringent. SCS is the only certifier that's currently making use of that, although we'll see if others step up. And so the other thing to, to think about, while, while it's strong, there's a lot that California 1350 doesn't address, like SDOCs, semi-volatile organic compounds, and then other indoor health hazards. Uh, and none of the emission protocols that we've gone through so far are ANSI standards at this point, and we've discussed that that can be an important level of buy-in and rigor. So an effort's been started, was started by NSF and Green Guard Environmental Institute to develop an ANSI standard, but UL then purchased Green Guard and NSF stepped away from the effort. So all that's happened relatively recently, and there's there's no clarity right now on what's going to happen next. So. I, you know, I'd expect to see at some point either one or both of them is going to continue the process of moving towards an ANSI standard, but I'm not sure where that's, where that's going to play out. The thing to be aware of is that there's a lot of efforts to coordinate with international emission standards, and this includes efforts to validate results between labs to ensure consistent results. So there's really good work going on in, in this sector that are worth keeping an eye on. Um, but at the same time, right now, it's still you know, if you're just trying to specify products based on a decent indoor air quality standard, California Section 1350 is still where it's at. FSC and forestry. So I do imagine that some of you on this call are, are totally in the middle of the FSC SFI battle. <laughs> Others are wishing it would go away. Some of you may not know what I'm talking about, though. I, I, I'm not sure of that. So in brief, FSC, the way I see it, FSC was the first certification of forestry practices. And the thing about forestry is it's a prime example of where green certifications are useful because a consumer simply can't independently verify whether wood was sustainably harvested. So FSC was developed largely through the environmental community in an alternate program. The SFI was developed out of industry frustration with FSC. So FSC is more prescriptive than FSC, SFI. Uh, which helps because you know what you're getting, but it also limits the flexibility of foresters. And that's a really quick, basic summary of a huge debate with a lot of pros and cons that the USGBC has right, been right in the middle of. Uh, there's a whole bunch of documentation about the pros and cons of each system. You know, proponents of FSC argue that you know, SFI waters down protection of forests uh, at the same time, FSC is being challenged to become more broadly available. And SFI is becoming more rigorous. So there's, there's a lot of good things about the fight that's going on. At the same time, uh, in some ways, it's a distraction from a lot of the other things that, that the uh, green building movement needs to pay attention to. So I mean, to my mind, you know, we are still proponents of FSC, but at the same time, it's the point that SFI makes that is, is valid to consider is that forestry is frequently a less environmentally problematic uh, practice and material than, say, agriculture or a number of other uh, basic materials. And so it doesn't necessarily make sense to 
do some other material as opposed to, it, you know, if you can't get FSC, you then decide to go for a different material entirely. Uh, so it's good. I think what I'm saying is we appreciate the increased rigor for all categories, but the the level of scrutiny across categories is not consistent right now. Case in point. My experience, excuse me, Jennifer, mm -hmm. if we can get FSC, we will go to one of the other certification systems because we're not going to change the um, material you know, to metal or plastic if we are looking for wood. Good. That's good to hear. So you're not so you're not seeing anybody saying, okay, well. No. No, but I still encourage one of the other certification systems that because like you say, FSC is not always readily available and we get to get the project done. Yeah, that sounds that's that's the most practical way to do it, I think. Okay, so the argument so I mean I've I've heard the argument from SFI folks that we don't want to encourage people to go to other materials and I'm I'm hearing you saying, well that's not really how material choices are made anyway. So Mm -hmm. That's good. In the uh, specification world, if it's a lead project, it's FSC or not. And you do, of course, a strategy. If your wood doors give you more than 50% of the value, then you make them FSC certified. And then it's, uh, at least my experience, that millwork, blocking, wood floors, uh, wood lab caseworker are then ignored. Most people stop at um, just achieving the credit. And if they can't achieve the credit and they still want wood, uh, they worry less about the certification at all. In um, a thousand projects, I've never seen SFI requested. But so, have you seen? Have you seen anybody say, "Okay, well, I don't have enough. I can't. I can't spec enough FSC to to get this credit. So maybe I'll put in a little more recycled content steel instead." No. No, no. No, it, it, it is either get the credit or not, and then move on because there are plenty of credits to choose from. Yep. Yeah. Good, and that's all changing anyway. So 2012 is just throw all of this out of the water. All right. So material attribute claims. Um, this is a pet peeve of mine. So um, these are everywhere. Product is compostable, recycled, bio-based, etc. Uh, some of these are really useful and relevant for assessing a product's environmental performance, but a lot of the times they're not products that are free of a certain substance, it's never even in that type of product. Uh, in those cases, the claim is just distracting. Um, also, some of these may look rigorous, but not hold up in practice. One recent example, the FTC cracked down on the compostable label based on a, it's basically based on an established ASTM standard that may indeed adequately reflect rigorous composting uh, in an industrial facility, but uh, it's been shown not to reflect real practice in either municipal compost facilities, certainly not residential backyard compost. So they've been cracking down on that. And then you have the, the bio-based label, which unlike forestry certification, just we were just talking about, it doesn't say anything about the environmental impact of the biomaterial included. Uh, so to my mind, a little bit of greenwash. So I wanted to step back just a little bit. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of a detour to put certifications in perspective uh, and look at the whole life cycle of a product or material to assess, well, is this claim actually relevant? Uh, so if you look at bio-based materials, the rapidly renewable, you know, PLA plastics, others, uh, there's a whole bunch of things to pay attention to beyond just is it bio-based. So there's, you know, growing and harvesting impacts, there's processing additives, chemical use, there's greenhouse gases, if you're talking about wool and leather in particular, there's conflicts with food products. So if you're growing corn and soy for food as opposed to growing it for plastics, uh, social impacts, there's a whole bunch of things to pay attention to here. And um, at GreenBuild, I found myself, last year I found myself chatting with a manufacturer who was really proud of their new bio-based binders. And it was a bit hard to, to break it to him that, to my mind, you know, for GreenSpec, Bio-based alone didn't necessarily mean it was green. So this is an area where I'd say that, that certifications, there are certifications out there, but um, you know, sustainable forestry, organic agriculture, fair trade, uh, there, there are other certifications, 
not just bio-based. So to generalize this, it's really useful to step back and understand the basics of life cycle thinking and use that to evaluate whether a certification is really addressing what matters most for the product. So educating yourself even at the basic level about what are the major impacts for a different product type. Uh, you know, is it raw materials, final products manufacturer, is it use phase, or challenges at end of life? That's going to tell you more about whether the claims and labels and certifications are actually significant. So there are a slew of multi-attribute green certifications now that help with this. But uh, what's tricky there is ensuring that the key issues actually are dealt with. So this is kind of just a, this is a, you know, step away and look what, what, what a multi-attribute standards actually cover. And for one thing, they cover, you know, they cover policies and programs from the company. So does the manufacturer use design for environment developing its, its uh, products? It also looks at the product life cycle and, and the product in use and product emissions, all that kind of stuff around the product. Uh, and then finally, a lot of them end up looking at corporate behavior. So similar to things that you know, FSC and SFI start to look at, what, what is, how, how does the company that's manufacturing these products treat its employees and so forth. Generally, they do look at the different life cycle phases, what's going on in the supply chain of materials, manufacturing, and of use you know, throughout the, the life cycle phases. And they look at different impacts, materials, energy, water, emissions, social hazards. Um, uh, Jennifer, do you have mm -hmm. any particular confidence in the Dow Jones Sustainability Index? The manufacturers seem to all hunt that list and try and move up. I didn't know if that had... Uh, was something you were familiar with? I, I mean, to my mind, the the various efforts to do corporate social responsibility and and disclosure at at that level make a lot of sense. Um, it's been you know I've been looking more. I mean, we'll talk later on. I've been looking more at the the other certifications that are that are new coming out, like uh, like the the UL's 880 standard, um, but I think the you know the basic ones that that have been around for a little while are also very useful. So, just getting back to, I mean, really what we're talking about here, for the most part, are are product specific standards, uh, but that then sort of get out that sort of bridge out into corporate behavior and, and other things with the manufacturer. And one of the tricky things there is, well, are they really dealing with the product itself? Uh, so, so I'm kind of jumping, jumping around a little bit. To my mind, we really need to be looking at the, the, the practices of the company as a whole. I think we need to get there. But at the same time, we need to do that without ignoring what's going on with the product itself. Um, Jennifer, do you know if LEED 2012 will adopt this multi-attribute standards or try to? I'm not sure they're going to be adopting things in, in this way, in a sort of uh, You know, adopting another set of of product specific standards, mm -hmm. as opposed to trying to move more to a to a life cycle, you know, a, a broader basis for materials. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, just in terms of the structure of multi attribute standards, uh, you know, they're all a little bit different, but usually, uh, except for there's a few standards that that require uh, that a product meet all of the requirements, but most of them are set up so that there are, you know, there's a set of prerequisites and then there's points that you have to meet. And then depending on how many of those points you meet, you can achieve, you know, silver, gold, platinum tier or some other tier structure uh, of achievement. But they often don't have, um, some of them do, many of them don't have any kind of distribution requirements within that. So once you've meet the, met the prerequisites, it may be that you can get your points from any part of the, uh, the system. So for instance, you might be able to get most of your points basic level from policy changes. 
and not necessarily from product changes. And so different standards have tried to, to play with this in terms of you know, making it so that there's more requirements um, at earlier stages. So for instance, you have to meet a certain number of product level points, not just policy points in order to get a basic level or something like that. Really what it comes down to is, is how the scorecard is set up. And what's, what's difficult is that frequently we do not have access to the scorecard. So it really helps to know what you're getting in there. And comprehensiveness is really good in terms of, you look at the overall standard. This is what I do. I look at the overall standard and go, you know, well, for one, that's great. They cover a lot of the things that are important. But from a specifier's point of view, if you're, if you're really interested in some specifics, like, for instance, a low emitting product, it's important to know whether or not that standard requires a low emitting product because in many cases it doesn't. So you may be, you know, you may have a product that's achieving a multi-attribute certification without that particular, uh, without that particular point. So I'm not necessarily going to go into details on on any of these specific standards, but I, I you know, I'm happy to in the Q and A but I wanted to give a few main differences. Um, and I, I also just want to say that there's pros and cons to all of these systems, which is why they've all got that, uh, that half little icon there. Um, a few main differences, Green Seal, Eco Logo, and EU's Eco Label, uh, along with many other green labels internationally, are all part of the, they're part of the global eco labeling network. They've been audited by international peers to meet ISO 14,000. 21, and um, that's basically for those those single attribute claims that we have to, sorry the um, the check mark of approval that we talked about earlier. So each of these are multi attribute standards that uh, they aren't tier based like we were talking about before. You have to meet the full set of criteria. Ecologo is backed by the Canadian government, but it was recently bought by UL Canada, so now it's tied to UL Environments Label Development, um, and these three systems each certify products based on their own multi-attribute standards for particular sectors. So these tend to be all or nothing systems. So you have to meet all the criteria for their particular standard. And um, some of them are quite robust, but when you look at some of the standards, some of them are also relatively out of date. And it's important to check and see, OK, when was this, when was this standard developed and is it really up to date? Uh, UL is planning on, up, on upgrading the eco logo standard, so there should be a slew of those coming out in the near term. Cradle to Cradle and Smart are both proprietary labels that claim to be pushing the bar beyond what others can do in you know the more more rigorous consensus process through ANSI, and each of them does that do that in some way. But in each case, there's also some concerns that we can go into in Q and A if you wish. Uh, UL and SCS are developing along a different strategy that I think would be a good one for specifiers to pay attention to, which is basically creating a label for their certification to a growing set of multi-attribute standards for specific products. So these are, they're basically certifying to the standards that we'll see on the next slide. So again, the last slide was widely applicable certifications, some of them based on standards included in this list, some of them not. And I would recommend specifying based on these. What these are are largely multi-attribute standards developed in some version of the consensus process. Some of them may be, some of them are ANSI approved, uh, some of them are not or not yet. Um, it still makes sense to look at the details, though, and because what you may consider is that you may want to specify beyond just the standard to. Saying, to mentioning a specific level of certification. So you may, so for instance, um, carpet is the most obvious example because California has already done that and specified to, uh, you know, you have to be 140 platinum. So this is something that specifiers may want to do also to push the bar if you're working on a particularly, uh, you know, high, large volume project or working with the government or whatever, to see if it makes sense to specify, you know, E3 level three instead of just E3. Uh, and along those lines, what I haven't seen a whole lot of, but, but I think may start to make sense, is to go the next level of it. There are particular concerns that matter that aren't requirements in the standard, 
uh, you know, particular credits that are in those standards that may be useful language to use in specifications. So for instance, what, some, what one of the standards says about toxicity may be a useful way to frame, uh, frame specifications for an issue of concern. So again, what I was saying is that the details really do matter, and this is just a little example of that. And there's a few differences that I want to point out. So first, some standards may have restricted substances as a prerequisite. Others don't. The level of resolution required for chemical inventories and hazard reduction can differ by multiple orders of magnitude. So this is basically a question of, well, how little is none? Um, also, some standards require low emissions for products, and for others, it's optional. So this line may not have circled the right one. This one's level, it's optional. So you may need an additional certification to be able to tell, OK, well, I want you know, a product that's meet this sort of multi-attribute set of concerns, but also want to be sure that it's a low-emitting product. So what do you go for? Singular multi-attribute standards. So again, we've given some indication that regardless of which you choose, you really need to pay attention to, to what it's covering. So for single attribute, it's important to know its limits, but there are some places, for instance, in the air quality where really it, you, want to, you want to stick to those. And for multi-attributes, it's, it's really good to know what it covers. You know, ask for the scorecard, ask for details, make sure that you've got the, you know, those specific credits that you really are concerned about, or look for EPDs. So I'm not really going to get into this today. But it's, it makes sense to pay attention to this emerging world of EPDs. They've been around for a while, and it's, but it's slowly starting to ramp up. Uh, UL has now just launched, uh, launched an EPD program. So what these, these are, environmental product declarations, are basically an effort to provide rigorous, rigorous, standardized, and detailed information on products. And a lot of people see this as the next step, not necessarily supplanting seal of approval type labels, but um, supplementing them. So for example, the think chair is level three certified, but it also has a full EPD. So you can say, OK, level three, but then you can look for yourself and see what the numbers are, why it, why it got that, uh, what those concerns really are. So that's OK, cool. Jennifer, we have 10 minutes to go. Are you near the end of your slideshow? Ooh, no, I'm only about halfway through. <coughs> <laughs> All right. allow time for questioning and answering. Yeah, so I'm just going to skim through slides, and then I think what, maybe what I'll do is I can stop. Um, sure. Yeah, so corporate sustainability. Again, like I'm saying, this is this is you know emerging out of emerging out of the corporate social responsibility and social responsibility, social responsible investing movement. So that's like the Dow Jones Sustainable Index, and there's a bunch of new things coming out there. Um, I guess where I was starting to go was again just stepping up and going take a broad level view of the category. The most important thing is to step back, take a broad level view of the category. Um, in terms of what really matters. And then there's the certifications. And so you can take the step out and then take a step look back. So I'm just going to go through which certifications I think are tops. So Green Seal GS11 2010 and MPI X Green are different, but both of them provide a higher level of uh, a higher level of view than other paint certifications out there right now. Carpets, NSF 140, I think many of you know about that. Uh, sustainable Choice is really NSF 140, but branded. DRI Green Label Plus may still be relevant. It's emissions-based, um, but some of that is NSF 140. OK. Let's see. So if I've only got 10 minutes. Nine minutes now. 5th my level is important to know about. Matt, are there any questions on the floor? We, at the moment, do not have any. So okay. I will continue to operate as such. OK, so why don't you continue, Jennifer? Yeah. And I'm definitely open to questions, folks, because um, I, I tend to do better in questions and answers. So um, if we want to make this discussion, I'd love to hear what kind of concerns that you have, and, and then also you know, what, what works in terms of specifications, or what, what insights do you have to give me? Um, so let's see here. 
I guess what I'm trying to say here in terms of, you know, the first step, ignore the worst greenwash offenders. That's really a common sense issue. And then take a step back and look at well, what's really important here. Um, it would be actually really interesting for me to switch to questions and answers sometime soon and just hear from some of your audience in terms of uh, what the, the role of the specifier is as opposed to the designer. Because I've mostly been, I've been more working with the designer community in terms of trying I to. I do have things. one, I have one question here. Um, saying, what do you or how do you feel about standards that may have banned materials um, or red list materials? Yeah, that's actually a really, a really fun one. Um, personally, what I would like to see is to have us move beyond the the red list approach towards one that looks at at the the characteristics of chemicals, because the problem with the red list approach is it's it's the, the ten, a, a common tendency is to respond to the red list by putting a similar chemical in the place of a red listed chemical. And so in some ways it's an important first step, uh, but it's, it's really insufficient if we're trying to get to truly healthy products. So moving towards it, if anybody knows about the green screen, it's, it's still a relatively complicated system, but the, the point of the system is to start moving towards being able to evaluate uh, transparent way whether a chemical is likely to have, you know, what, what hazard characteristics a chemical has. Um, there are some standards that take this kind of approach. I think, I think GS11, Green Seal's standard is one of those. Uh, there's others that are starting to move in the direction of, of basically instead of having a, a long red list, they say no chemicals with the characteristics of, you know, no carcinogens or uh, PBTs or reproductive development toxins. Uh, Jennifer, since um, people will have the chance to look at this again, if you could advance through your remaining slides at maybe four or five seconds a slide where people can, you know, they'll be able to, to look at it slowly, um, I think it would, um, it would just help. Yeah, and I've, I've went through most of them pretty quickly. But I think the key slides to pay attention to, uh, this one, which basically shows you what are the, the new standards coming out and the existing multi-attribute standards out there. Um, so a lot of these are categories which really haven't had uh, that kind of detailed treatment. And so See the, and part of the issue is that there's product in our industry, there's product selection and there's specification writing. And so if the some of the products are selected by designers, um, some of them are commodity products that are um, uh, are less visual, more performance oriented, and um, people are are seeing that lead is um, the only game in town that green globes and and chips and, and others are, are pretty far behind and likely to stay that way. So although you might have a, a ULE 100 on chips and panels, until uh, we can understand what that is, it's not going to drive um, uh, product selection, um, you know, which I'm aware of. Perhaps, um, again, it's a distinction between what Building Green is doing um, um, and environmental product news and um, what the contractors eventually get in their specifications. Um, yeah. Because there are 500 certification programs out there, you know, for the few projects they're working on, that, you know, that's, that's excellent, but it's, it, um, we're moving forward fairly slowly. So are you saying if a, if a standard is not in lead, not reference in lead, it's not worth it? It, well, no, it, it may be worth a great deal. It's not, um, and if anybody's on the call that has a different experience, but um, again, across many hundreds of products and many hundreds of projects, um, some of the designers will will go for recycled content in their entrance mats. It, it really makes no difference in lead because entrance mats don't cost enough to tip the, the balance. Um, so there there's a distinction between product selection and and uh, spec writing, and and no one really picks entrance mats, for example, on um, on recycled content, um, whether it's a lead project or 
or not. So we're in the situation of, um, you know, worrying more about performance. Uh, a roof made out of paper mache doesn't do anyone any, any good. It needs to be a roof. Yeah, I mean, obviously, number one is is making sure that the that the product performs well. Um, and if if you are going to start, I, I mean, the the UL standards, I think, are their intention is to include actually many of these to include more. But do you, do you see standards that that focus on performance? Beyond existing standards, you mean? I mean, some of the, the multi-attribute ones are starting. Some of those include performance aspects within the standard. Uh, you're not going to get performance out of a recycled content certification, but but UL has definitely been focusing on including performance. MPI, I mean, that's part of the reason you know MPI X Green is done better because MPI is focused on uh, right. performance as well. So I'd I think you to, are seeing more of that. Jennifer, I'd have to concur with Mark. I, I don't see multi-attribute standards, ISO standards, even California 1350 standards in specifications, but I do see full score, green guard, green label, and Indy star because they're more common, commonly used. So I, I think what you're saying is maybe we should be using the other standards. Well, I mean, so that's, uh, to my mind, and, uh, you know, I was talking with with a, a designer specifier a, a, about this, about, for example, the fact that California 1350 is the background for floor score and mm -hmm. some of these other things. And that right. the, the, this is sort of the ideal, um, is just to, to simplify that. I mean, what we're, what we're, like you said, what we're using is the labels that are out there uh, as best we can. And it would be nice to get to the place where we could be, where what you could be saying is I want to make sure that I want to specify products that meet that can be that are certified to have met the standard mm -hmm. and you don't have to play that game with you know the the, the ten different labels that that are associated with that standard mm -hmm. um, and to Jennifer, where we're, mm -hmm. we're coming up to the end of our time did you have any uh, closing thoughts, and can people email you if they'd like to continue uh, the discussion? Yeah, I mean, people can definitely email me, and 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 I I look forward to that. I think dialogue tends to be my more more natural mode of operation. So again, I, I tend to be behind the scenes, and maybe there's a reason for that. But um, I look forward to to conversation, particularly around you know my last point, which is what I have here, which is I think what what the end goal to my mind is that we have robust multi-attribute standards that we are continually uh, pushing the bar on those, but that we're using the ones that we have and uh, kind of ignoring a lot of the label label mess. I think that the, the industry is going to be moving that direction anyway. Uh, Before we close out, can we get your email? Is it on a slide that you could present on screen here? It's, it's pretty easy. I don't have it on the slide, but I, I will. Uh, to Jennifer at buildinggreen.com. Okay. Okay. With that, we probably should end because we're one minute over our hour. And uh, thank you for joining us, Jennifer. If, if anyone has further questions, they can feel free to email Jennifer directly. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.